video lecture number 21. So um, we have now actually come to a mature age. Um, pregnancy, induction of labor part two, where we will focus on methods. How? The overview uh, in part one, we discussed the indications for induction of labor for the main indications for mother and fetus. And now we will focus on what method should we use and what determines what to choose when. Again, research informed, very uh, re um, rewarding that I am fortunate that I can use, make use of recent uh, randomized clinical trials and I'm very appreciative of my colleagues who perform these very impressive studies. The method how, um, interesting, you, you are here at a road and you have to make a decision. Should we, you made the decision to induce labor, but now you have two options. And the decision what road to take will be mainly determined by one part of the uterus and that's the cervix. If the cervix is unfavorable or not ripe, priming of the cervix is indicated via either a balloon, a balloon which is inserted through the cervix in the extra amniotic space, so between the amnion, between the membranes and the uterine wall, and or various prostaglandins which can be administered in different ways. Or the cervix is favorable, or as we say in Australia, ARMable, it has nothing to do with a leg or an arm, but it refers to the mnemonic artificial rupture of membranes, followed by oxytocin. So the cervix is the central organ which we need to have assessed, which we need to assess before we know what to do, what road to take. So the woman asks your doctor, is my cervix favorable or not? Another way to see it is the cervix ajar, is the door of the cervix slightly open or firmly closed. How do we assess that? Here you see a picture, by the way, of a non-pregnant cervix, but this is when you would look at this cervix, your eyes would tell you that the cervix, the os, is absolutely pinpoint, is closed, and the see the cervix has still a convincing structure, um, it seems to be long and closed, but it's hard to assess. So, it cervix appears to be closed, long and firm, but our eyes are not the most favorable um, to use to make that call. However, what we do is our cervical assessment at this stage is still based not on eyeballing, but via digital vaginal examination. And with digital, I mean fingers. What are my fingers feeling for or what are your feeling fingers feeling for? Here you see a diagram where the gloved hands are gently introduced into the vagina and the fingertips are assessing the cervix. Certain characteristics of the cervix and the, how deep the presenting part is engaged. A few diagrams. On the left hand side we see a cervix which is not yet a face, so the cervix is still long. The cervical length is more than the thickness of the uterine wall. And the cervix is still close, not dilated. Here in the middle we see the cervix is now flat. There is no more depth in the cervix and the thickness of the cervix is equal to the thickness of the uterine wall of the lower uterine segment and the cervix is slightly open, one centimeter. And here you see the situation which you would encounter at the end of stage one of labor. The cervix is fully effaced and fully dilated to 10 centimeters. So the fingers are assessing these characteristics of the cervix. Interesting that Edward Bishop published in 1964 already an, an interesting paper and you should have a read about the, what is now called the Bishop score. He came up with five characteristics, four of whom are related to the cervix, 
the dilatation, the effacement, the consistency and the position of the cervix, and the station, which means how deep is the presenting part, the head, engaged. How and <clears throat> this um, was based on a limit study, it was an observational study, but still, we still refer to the assessment of the cervix by the finger of the obstetrician or the midwife as the so-called bishop score. Here we see the characteristics <clears throat> more into detail. The score is given either between 0, 1, 2 and 3. The dilatation of the cervix is the first. The consistency of the cervix. If the cervix is really firm, no points. If the cervix is really soft, you give maximum of 2 points. The position of the cervix. Least favorable is the cervix is still very much posterior, pointing towards the sacrum. Effacement, the thinning of the cervix, is expressed in percent between 0 and 30, etc. How deep is the head engaged? When the head is at the interspinous line, that is called zero or station, the, that would give that particular cervix uh, two, um, two points for the bishop's score. So this is how we score the bishop's score. And it's an attempt to make it more objective. Of course it's not, because it still depends how you assess these parameters. In general, if the bishop's score is less than 5 or 6, we regard the cervix as unfavorable, and we need to prime the cervix first. And the bishop's score of more than 8, the cervix is very, very favorable, and we choose a different way to induce labor. So essential to get that concept straight. Um, if the surface is not favorable, first option is a transcervical balloon, the second option is using prostaglandin. The cervical balloon, we either can use a single balloon, which we place gently, so on top of the cervix in the lower neutron segment, or a double balloon, where we place one balloon in the same spot and the second balloon stays below the cervix in the vagina. Secondly, prostaglandins. We can administer prostaglandin E2, PGE2, high in the vagina, close to the cervix, either in the form of a gel, where the gel is the vehiculum of the PGE2, or the same drug, but now in a slow-release tape, which releases <coughs> um, the prostaglandin in principle up to 18 to 14 hours. The alternative which is now researched recently is prostaglandin E1 orally, 50 micrograms administered for hourly. This is a well-researched area and I will report to you the latest. If the cervix is favorable or ARMable, we do not need to uh, uh, ripen the cervix, we can go straight to ARM artificial rupture of membranes, and in Australia they call that, funny enough, breaking the waters. In Holland, no such thing exists. We break the membranes, we break the vlies. But this is followed by the administration of syntocinone, it's sometimes called oxytocin or piton S in the United States, intravenously, and always in an incremental dose, we start at a very low level and stepwise we increase it until we have about three to four, the woman has three to four contractions in 10 minutes. Or if you would use an intrauterine pressure catheter, 200 Montevideo units, which is a multiplication of the number of the contractions in 10 minutes times the, um, the amplitude. Interesting, this is an area which is hardly being researched in the last 50 years we still practice in the same way as in the previous century. Interesting, are we doing well or is there room for improvement? I think we always should look at, can we improve? Okay, the artificial rupture of membranes, we see here on the left-hand side a panel, a diagram, where the fingers are inserted through the cervix, uh, make contact with the presenting part, check, that you don't feel anything untoward, such as vasa previa or an umbilical cord. And then with this special amni hook, you scratch the membranes and indeed 
you break the membranes and as a result the water will escape, the amniotic fluid will escape. But that requires a dilatation of at least one and a half to two centimeters and a presenting part which is clearly cephalic. Here on the right hand side we see the typical instrument used for that, an amni hook, which is a plastic disposable instrument with a little sharp tip at the end. Or there is another clever, an amni cut, where the little hook is at the tip of the uh, index finger. So here is where you only have to insert your index finger and scratch the membranes with the same result. Okay, if the cervix is favorable, we administer intravenous oxytocin, as you know, that exactly identical to the polypeptide produced by the posterior, posterior pituitary gland, the hypothesis, and we commence at a very low level and increase step by step over time. Do you know why we do that? Yes, the individual sensitivity of the uterus varies between one woman and the other, and even the same woman in this delivery might be more or less sensitive compared to the next delivery. So we start at a low dose to prevent overstimulator, hyperstimulation, too many contractions, which we call tachycystole. And we aim for, as mentioned, to three or more, three or four contractions, no more in than three to four in ten minutes. If you go to five, that will eventually compromise the fetal condition. So we, in order to monitor the fetus and the contractions, we mo most countries will apply use in a continuous CTG, either externally, but usually after you break the water, if you have ruptured the membranes, a fetal scalp electrode will give you a more reliable signal. And here we see the CTG machine. On the left hand side, uh, it depicts with a speed of one centimeter per minute usually, the fetal heart rate. And here on the right hand side, we see um, this little part going up and down. This is apparently a uterine contraction. So here we can count the frequency of the contractions, but we have no idea of the intensity. Important to take on board. Okay, <clears throat> let's now go back to the unripe cervix. The door is completely closed, it's black. And how would we go about that? First, on the left hand side, we see the Foley indwelling catheter, which is usually used for, uh, to insert inside the bladder. It requires a gentle speculum examination, and we have to insert the catheter through the cervix. As soon as the balloon is located on top of the cervix, we can inflate it with 50 or 30 milliliters of normal saline. We apply gentle traction. By the way, traction or not does not have a difference uh, as far as the outcomes is concerned, and you fix the lower part, the external part to the thigh. On the right hand side, two pictures. One is of the Cook's catheter. Here we see the internal balloon being inflated on top of the cervix between uh, the internal os cervix and the fetal part and the uterus. And the second balloon is now about to be uh, inflated. And here we see the external balloon inflated and the internal balloon inflated. It seems to be yeah, you would think logically it makes, gives more pressure towards the uterus and it will eventually result in the release of prostaglandins by the uterus. Um, which catheter is to be preferred? I have not found a prospective randomized clinical trial, but recently at a meeting in the United States there was a retrospective order done and that was um, a poster and which showed traditionally this hospital used the double lumen balloon, the double balloon, uh, and they compare it with a single balloon and these data show it's retrospective, but it gives you the indication that the single balloon performed better uh, in regard to time to delivery, lower cesarean section rates, shorter hospital stay, less chorea amniotis, and much cheaper. So we have to take this information with a grain of salt, but I think it's clear if it's, it doesn't make a difference, we should go for the single balloon catheter. By the way, if we start administer, before we start administering prostaglandins, what, condition, what conditions need to be met? First, the patient should be febrile because prostaglandins can result in slightly increase of the body temperature. 
and you don't want to start with an, uh, an, an infection already. There should be no active vaginal bleeding, the CTG should be normal prior to commencement, and the patient, of course, has understood and given solid informed consent. And of course, the bishop score should be less than 4, 5, or 6. There is no contraindications, which I will discuss towards the end of this lecture. The drug of choice for, to be used in the vagina is PGE2, dinoprostin. Di means two. Um, how can we administer dinoprostin, PGE2, high in the vagina, as close as possible to the cervix, without inserting it into the cervix, because that could result in uh, absorption in the bloodstream and unwanted side effects. There is two options. We can administer a gel of either one or two milligrams, as available in South Australia, in a two milliliter uh, gel. Surfdale, which is a vaginal insert or vaginal tape, which contains altogether 10 milligrams of the PGE2, which is released slowly over 18 hours, which equals roughly 0.3 milligram per hour. What are the difference between both methods? Um, the duration, so if you have a very unfavorable cervix in a nulliparous woman, you probably would choose for opt for cervidil. If you would induce labor in a higher risk situation, for instance, suspicion IGR, I would personally choose the cervidil because it can be removed very easily, whilst as soon as you have inserted the gel high in the vagina, it's hard to remove it. So those are the two differences. Moreover, the Cervidel in principle is much more expensive than two administrations of the gel. The prostaglandins, a little bit of background information. Here we see aricolic acid and eventually um, it's here on the left hand side you see PGE2 um, and this is PGE1. The only difference is there's a double bond here in two spots and there's only one here in PGE1. And we use that in obstetrics for cervical ripening. Outside of obstetrics it's used for various reasons, uh, for instance for erectile dysfunction or um, for gastric ulcer treatment. So PGE1 is very cheap uh, because it was not used in, it's now actually off-label use in obstetrics. The PGF2 alpha um, it's not topic of this lecture, but it's the most potent uterotonic drug we know. So it results in a very firm, solid contraction of the uterus, and it's a treatment for postpartum hemorrhage. How do prostaglandins work? I think it's good to have an idea. Um, how does it favor that cervix starts effacing, becomes softer? Um, it will alter the extracellular ground substance of the cervix, and um, various connective tissues such as um, collagenase in the cervix, there are two types of collagenase in the cervix, it increased the amount of elastase which is more flexible and um, the hyaluronic acid which is part of the pathway of prostaglandins as showed you in the previous slide. So eventually the prostaglandins will over time result in relaxation of the cervical smooth muscle and it facilitates dilatation. So, relaxation of the cervical muscles and not contraction of the uterine muscle, that's what it should do ideally. It, by the way, it increases the availability of intracellular calcium, which can, if it's absorbed systemically, uh, result in contraction of the myometrium, of the uterine wall. Let's go now to a number of impressive a randomized clinical trial. The first one is from uh, Joswiak in the Netherlands, published in the Cochrane database, a review in 2012, and later from the same group from the Netherlands, the Probat study, published in the Lancet in 2011. They compared women in, uh, induced for labor, and I show you the indications already in the first lecture of this series, and they looked at the outcomes, whether the women were induced with a single balloon Foley balloon or vaginal PGE2, eventually it did not make a difference for the cesarean section rates. So the unfavorable service 
responded equally. There was no significant difference in the vagina delivery within 24 hours. And if you look at the fetal hyperstimulation, it means more than um, four contractions in 10 minutes plus CTG changes, such as these decelerations, and typically you can see that that was significantly, the risk was significantly lower in the balloon group. So the efficacy to result in delivery was the same, but the safety profile of the balloon was superior. If we look um, at the mode of delivery, cesarean section rates were 23 versus 20 percent and that means uh, that crosses the one line so no differences so in, in the conclusion we should um, um, yeah if we can we should favor the balloon here you see some of the risk associated with the prostaglandins um, i will not go into detail if you want to read it in the article it's readily available but mainly when you look at this, um, there was a significant difference in the need for um, augmenting, augmentation by oxytocin in the Foley catheter group a bit more uh, and the time difference. But these, the, these differences are actually not very, very relative in my view. So what are the risks for if we administer prostaglandins high in the vagina, uterine hyperstimulation, which means per definition five or more contractions in 10 minutes if there are CTG changes as well. Tachycystole is the definition of more than five contractions in 10. CTG changes in other words, compromise of the fetus and hence continuous fetal monitoring is important especially in a high-risk situation so if there's an patient for an IGR fetus. The risk could be in theory as well, uterine rupture or perforation, if you would induce labor in a lady with a previous cesarean section scar. And what we discussed briefly, the PG gel is sometimes, it's hard or impossible to remove from the vagina. There are some maternal side effects such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and subfibral sub ten, uh, temperature. If we look at the PROBAT2 study, where women were randomly allocated to a Foley catheter group or mesoprostol orally, uh, 50 micrograms, uh, so PGE1 administered orally, uh, 50 micrograms every four hours until delivery, we can see here that uh, if you look at the intention to treat analysis, um, that there is no significant differences in the primary outcome of the study. If you look at um, the per protocol analysis, so that was the women, you look at the actual management of the women, there was no difference as well. By the way, a big study where more than 924, sorry, 924 were in the misoprostol group and 921 in the Foley catheter group. If you look at the cesarean section rates, 16.8 versus 20.1 percent, and that's not significant. If you look at spontaneous delivery, again, close to the one, the relative risk of one, so no differences. So the PROBAT2 study, if you look at failed induction of labor, um, the Foley catheter now shows um, to have, um, let me have a look, 6.2% in the mesoprostol failed to progress in the first stage versus 10.6% in the Foley catheter group. So that's slightly lower in the mesoprostol group. Failed to progress in the second stage, no differences. Failed instrumental delivery, no differences. And the same for the suspicion of fetal distress. So in conclusion, if we compare oral prostaglandins E2 uh, PGE1 versus the single balloon in the PROBAT2 study as published in the Lancet just a few weeks ago. The composite outcome um, was there was no differences between the two. Caesarean section rate, um, <coughs> excuse me, not significantly different 
and the adverse event were not different as well. That concludes the big recent randomized clinical trials, which tell us, in fact, uh, which gives us a clear indication what the preferred option should be. Before we finish, you all might have heard of sweeping the membranes, or as we call it here in South Australia, a stretch and sweep exercise. That means if the vaginal examination, the fingers are, if you're able to insert the finger gently through the cervix, you can actually move the finger gently between the membranes and the lower uterine segment. That's what we call membrane sweeping. Is that helpful? What are the risks? Um, Michel Boulevin, the guy from the big randomized clinical trial of the LGA babies, published in 2005 in the Cochrane database. Here, the outcome was not delivered uh, before 41 weeks, and the group who had stretch and sweep or sweeping of the membranes had um, yeah, almost 40% uh, yeah, uh, higher chance that the baby was delivered before 41 weeks. So most certainly, if this is done on a weekly basis, stretch and sweep results in an early delivery compared to expected management. If the outcome would be the need for formal induction of labor, you have comparable outcomes. Um, a, relatively ri a relative risk here of 0 0.6, which is statistically significant, as you can see here in the first plot, where here all the studies are summarized. All studies are on the left-hand side of the one mark, hence significant. If you look at another outcome, and it's worthwhile to look because there are far more, more outcomes than I present here today, the delay to delivery. Um, on average, the delivery was brought forward by 2.48, so two and a half days after sweeping the membranes. Um, the study, this, uh, since uh, this um, uh, Cochrane database study concludes as well that stretch and sweep is probably safe for the mother and what we need to realize as well it's slightly painful for the woman but if she's really fed up with the pregnancy and she wants an induction maybe this is a reasonable go in between so this we're close to concluding part two methods essential is first to assess the cervix by the gloved uh, sterile uh, fingers and we assess the bishop score by assessing four parts, four determinants of the cervix and the fifth component is the, uh, the, the, the how far, how deep the presenting part is engaged. If the bishop score is less than five or six, ripening is required. We can do that with either a single trans cervical extra amniotic balloon or oral prostaglandin E1, the mesoprostol 50 micrograms per four hours. These two have the best safety profile, are the most effective, and have the lowest price. So it makes sense that these should be um, number one choice. Of course, we can administer per vaginum PGE2, either in gel form or in the slow release, the so called Cervidil. Um, if the cervix is favorable, yeah, there is, everybody would agree that artificial rupture of membranes, ARM followed by the intravenous administration of oxytocin in an incremental way to promote uterine contractions until they, come, they are occurring three to four times in 10 minutes. This is an area of research. It would be interesting to say, well, we give the lady a certain dose for an hour and then we discontinue. What would that be more effective? Would that be safer? Part three, as always, listen carefully, explain verbally, use written information, and show that you genuinely care. Empathy is great for the woman and great for the doctor, for your own job satisfaction. So here we see a summarizing a graph. On the left hand side, an unfavorable closed long cervix. Here we see the cervix is now effaced. In the third panel, we see the cervix is now favorable, aramable. 
the ARAM can be done. And fourthly, we see the cervix dilating, the head is descending, as which, which should happen in the first stage of labor. In the first situation, priming by prostaglandins, preferably oral or vaginal, or the use of a transcervical single balloon is warranted, which hopefully will result in a facing and slight dilatation of the cervix when we can proceed with ARAM and its syntoxinum. This concludes the 21st um, video lecture of the ROGA. And of course, as always, I would like to point at um, Jimmy on the left hand side. You see Jimmy in a agility training, was a little bit younger, younger, but you see him flying high. And now, most recently, he's still flying high. He came to a more mature age, and um, he is now with honor the Zen master in chief of the Roga. First and last but not least, I would like to thank you because in the meantime, we, um, we have noticed more than 2,777 views to date. And also a special thank to Professor Ben Moll who advised me in uh, preparing these two lectures. Thank you and I hope to meet you again very soon.